Well, thank you all for coming. I'm really happy that you're all here. I know some faces and it's really nice to see you and all the others also. Um, um, I'm talking about filter bubbles. I'm not the expert, so I invite you to discuss the topic. I mean, a lot of um, news have been on there online and stuff those days. So I really want to invite you to join the discussion. I don't want to be the um, expert here. I really invite you to discuss the topics. I will put some open questions at the end and um, I would really like you to join the discussion. It's quite political actually. So I'm going to talk about filter bubbles. I'm just sorry, I have to. So I'm talking about filter bubbles. Um, what are filter bubbles? Filter bubbles have been coined as a term like in 2009 by a guy called Eli Pereiser. Um, he wrote a book about it and he had a TEDx talk about it. So it's kind of his term, but it's very common now. And it describes a situation where um, the demo democratic debate on the internet is restricted by the filter algorithms that large platforms use. So this is one very famous um, representation from his TEDx talk. So you see here Google, Flipboard, Washington Post, Huffington Post, Amazon. So the, the world is very colorful and there's a lot of different opinions out there. But the fact that we are all confronted with, with um, filters the whole day long makes all the information be very monotonic and very, very <coughs> similar. All the information that you get is very similar. So your world is not very colorful anymore. It all turns into the same color because, yeah, different opinions can't enter your world anymore. So there's some very close notions that I would like to mention also. So the discussion about filter bubbles is also about walled gardens. So the effect of the filter bubbles is strengthened by the concept of walled gardens. So Facebook very early started to give you a filtered world of news also. Like you're not reading newspapers anymore. Google and Facebook have Google News and Facebook News and they, they decide what you might be interested in. So this effect is, so why do they do that? They really wanna keep you to their site. They give you the links within Facebook and they really want to keep you inside their universe. Why do they do that? They do that because they really want all the information on you and they don't want you to leave their pages and their world. So inside the garden, it's a little paradise, but you can't leave anymore. You don't leave anymore. They want, you, they want to keep you inside their universe. So the respective term is a walled garden. Little paradise inside, but you can't go out anymore. A third notion is echo room. Like when you're in a filter bubble, what happens is that your opinion is reflected by your surroundings. So whatever you feel like when you're politically to the right or politically to the left, all you see is your own opinion and you feel like the whole world thinks like you do. Like you're an AFD voter and you feel like all the world is concerned about immigration and everybody's worried and there's like, Everybody is of the same opinion that all those immigrants are really bad for you. Or on the other side, with your left hand, then you feel like there's all those AFD guys everywhere and, and they are really bad. So your own opinion gets reflected by what information you receive. So you really feel um, like everybody's think thinking the same thing. So that's the phenomenon of echo rooms. So, there's really this world where early pioneers of the internet were thinking like internet is the democratic debate per se. Like you can really communicate with whoever on the whole world, but it turned out that this is not true. Like filters are necessary. We all can't live without filters. Like we've been filtering since early days, like filtering is everywhere. Like I don't see everything in the room and I don't see everyone in the room because I'm filtering information. So if we were not filtering information, we couldn't use the internet anymore. But it didn't lead, like, so it did, the internet did not lead to the liberation of the debate, 
But now there is all those filtering and all those phenomena that really um, take the utopia world, where everybody's communicating with everyone and everybody can have his own opinion and we are free of the intermediation of media. Like, there's no Rupert Murdoch anymore determining what we think. That was the utopia. Like, early pioneers really believed in that stuff. And it turns out it's not true. It's like, it's, again, we're only uh, receiving what somebody might want to receive us. And this is not only about filters and about my world being restricted from being more colorful. It's not a personal problem. It turns into a political problem because it ha really has a big political dimension because more and more people are really receiving political news and news about the world only via Facebook. And so there's really like a lot of research on how many people were on the internet for Hillary Clinton, for Donald Trump. So how do those guys behave on the internet and what might this have as a consequence for their voting behavior? So there's a lot of, of statistics on how people use internet, how many friends they have, how heterogeneous their friends are, and who they voted for. There's this large debate about whether this effect um, really influenced the outcome of the vote. And we all know that there is an evil perspective to this. So very recently, the Cambridge Analytica scandal showed that there might be someone behind it who wants to determine how, the, how this works. So up to this point, we were at a point where we said, OK, there's filters who want to determine what you like. But at that point where Cambridge Analytica was in the media, there was someone who was actively trying to influence what we we're doing. So that's the current scandal, where, what everybody's very afraid of. All right, so this is me. <laughs> um, so what is my relationship to filter bubbles? Why am I talking about filter bubbles? Um, so first of all, like the reason why Sebastian inv invited me for this talk is I'm a nerd. So, um, so I was working at the Chair of Statistics and I was treating some of those effects, some dependency effects in my doctoral thesis. And since January 2018, I'm working at the Chair of uh, Software Engineering and at the Zentrum of Digitalisierung Bayern. So I'm currently doing some research on those algorithms, for example, together with Josef. Um, so we're talking about those filter algorithms and how they influence maybe the behavior of the people they, who are exposed to those filters. I have a different perspective on it because um, beyond being a statistician, I'm also a data scientist working at OneLogic. So I have also have a business perspective on the topic. So it's also about making money. It's necessary to have filters and it's also about making the internet usable. And we all have profits from it. Like the users of Amazon have a lot of profit also from the recommendations that they receive. So it's one of the topics that we're working on. For example, Zara is also working on some of those topics um, that concern cookies on the internet. So we are also having a business perspective on this topic and we're using those algorithms. And I have a third perspective, which is like my, so I'm working at OneLogic, and I have a third perspective, which is like my, my dark past that Sebastian already talked about. So I used to be a coolie and a pirate. So when we met, I was actually on the students' parliament as a pirate. <laughs> so those are my three perspectives. And what I want to do in this talk is shed some different perspectives on the topic. So the Kuvi here, she's very political and she's like engaged in, in trust and in the future of humanity. So she's the idealist. So what are those guys um, concerned about? So first of all, I'm going to talk about the business perspective, which is maybe most closest to you, like what are current topics? So if we do a filter project or if we do a customer client analysis, what might we be interested? So what, are, what is the current state of the art and the algorithms that you can use? So how, how do they treat um, people and, and um, 
what can we ask as a question as a data scientist. Then next, the Kubi will be asking, um, is there really like something like a risk or is that debate like just totally overflow and it's just inflated because there's no actual problem because we've been filtering for thousands of years and it's not very different to what is happening. And then I will torture you by applying the statistical um, perspective. So how are the risks? One of the questions that I'm asking is how are um, the risks that arise from the filter algorithms linked to statistical methods? So how do, are they reflected in statistical methods? And is it possible to model those effects, like to really pin them down in a model and to make them perceivable, like to not only have them as an abstract construct, but to really put them in a mathematical model. So that's what we are also working at on at the chair of software engineering. I will explain the um, connection later. Okay, so recommended systems. What are they interested in? I will have perspective here to better see what I'm talking about. So, recommender systems are, is, a, is a notion that summarizes the filtering algorithms. So, recommender, recommendation is the recommendation of an article, of a, of a friend, or of an object to you on the internet. So, it's a, a definition would be, definition would be, okay, I destroyed it. Um, just have to click on it probably. So uh, a recommender system is a subclass of information filtering systems that seeks to predict the rating of preference a user would give to an item. So I'm also working, working on those algorithms those days. I determine some characteristics of products um, or um, that might determine how much somebody likes a product. There's two kinds of information filtering systems or recommender systems. There's collaborative filtering and there's content-based filtering. So if I look at products and I give them characteristics and I will ask someone, um, how much do you like red cars? Then red is a characteristic and I can calculate a score for that person, how much she will like the car based on the color of the car. That's a content-based filtering algorithm. And there's also collaborative filtering, which arose early in the 90s for filtering emails, like to determine how is that spam or is the email important. And the collaborative aspect in it is that I rely on your judgment to judge whether it's important for me. So I rely on the information for a massive data set saying who likes what on Amazon, so might I like the same thing, and that's collaborative filtering. The big advantage of collaborative filtering is that you rely, rely you rely on the judgment of others. You don't need the information that the car is red. Like a lot of people have been clicking on the car and those people have been clicking on cars that you've also been clicking on. So somebody will recommend the car to you on the internet. That's collaborative filtering. You need massive data sets for that. That's a big data problem. It doesn't work very well when you have only a few things. Then you should better base on content-based filtering, saying the car is red, so she likes red cars, so she will like the car. And collaborative is really a big data thing. So it has so-called um, cold start problems. When you're starting your algorithms and you have only a few data, you have a cold start problem. They don't work very well in the beginning. Okay, so what is, what is questions that we might ask ourselves when a client asks us to do a filtering algorithm to give recommendations, um, like uh, which cinema film like which film in the cinema might somebody go to. So, trust. So one of the topics is that I need to um, have a platform that people trust in. And when people don't trust your judgment anymore, when I'm always suspect you that Amazon is showing me only the articles that are paying Amazon, um, then I don't trust Amazon anymore. So trust is a big issue. So they always, whenever they want to optimize their algorithms, they are thinking about trust, and that's also something the data scientists must think about. Then it's persistence. So how long will I keep on showing that person that article, or will I change? Like, 
if he doesn't click on it, will I show him another article or will I keep on showing him the article forever and ever? So that's an important aspect. It's labeling. It's if I, um, if I give different names to things, you can show that people react to them differently. So one thing that data scientists are concerned about are how do I label what I give to people? Then it's diversity. People might be very bored when they like very much cheese, but you always recommend them cheese. So they might be bored at some point. It might, you might be really successful by recommending a person um, cheese and lots of cheese, but maybe he prefers some diversity and wants some apple someday. Serendipity is similar, like um, uh, serendipity, serendipity sorry, um, is when I go to a shop and you recommend me to buy milk. You might be really right to recommend me to buy milk, but I'm buying milk every day, so it's not very surprising. So one of the things that we might build into our algorithms is serendipity, so to recommend things that are really different from the things that people like to buy. It might be better to have a lower success rate, but to recommend things that people are surprised about. Then privacy, of course. We have a large change in law. A change in law. There's the um, Europäische Datenschutzverordnung, uh, which is changing right now. So a big issue is privacy. You don't expose things, and it's a big issue. If I delete the email address of a person in the data set, that doesn't help. Like just people are very identifiable. There was a competition for recommender systems by Netflix, and they published a data set where they had a lot of people who were watching films. So they were anonym anonymizing it, so they took out the email addresses and the names. But it was easily shown two years after that those data could easily be matched by using Rotten Tomato data. So they were using this Netflix data and correlating it with data from Rotten Tomato, and they could easily identify who was who. So they could write to people and say, hey, we figured out that that was you in the Netflix data set, so that was a large scandal. It doesn't help to erase names. So privacy is really a big concern, which is one of the reasons why nowadays we're not allowed to transform, to, to put data on an Amazon instance which is private because the data physically goes to the US. And we're not allowed to do that anymore. It is some characteristics. You can implement different algorithms for different de demographic groups, like um, using also things like age or whatever. So you might profit from separating your data set on some, some demographics. And another thing is robustness. Like you don't want it to react very heavily to certain influence factors, and you don't want to, it to relate very, like to, um, to react very heavily um, when the user once clicks on something weird. Um, yeah, that's some consideration. Legislation, of course, which is very closely related to privacy. Yeah, that's only some kind of consideration. So you can really go into the details. When somebody asks me, please make an algorithm, there's some standard algorithms that I can use, but it really gets hard when I go into the details. And if I want to compete with the really big ones, that will be hard, because they have all those things in mind. Um, the point where this gets a bit weird is when you combine the um, filters with psychometrics. So the big discussion about Cambridge Analytica was because they were combining the filtering algorithms with psychometrics. So basing on what I click on, they might give me a rating on some, like, um, I will show you some later. So this is the point where it gets evil. I can make a lot of money from that, but this is evil, scientist Gilly. <laughs> um, <laughs> So if you know the personality of the people you're targeting, you can nuance your messaging to resonate um, more effectively with those key audience groups. So if I know that um, you're very much like somebody just had a child or whatever, and I can retarget my, my um, advertising to show different things to different people. That was a large debate about Trump, like that people who were like, um, very likely to, res to respond to messages about children were shown yeah, Trump will um, do everything for your child, and some people who were more like uh, worried about war, they showed different messages. So they adapted the message to um, 
the psychological profile. And they do that nowadays also on Netflix, like they show you different pictures about a film depending on what you click on usually. So they, they start showing different content to different people. Um, so the debate was about the Brexit. So there was the Cambridge Analytica scandal. The, um, the, 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 yeah, the idea was that they had actively influenced um, the Brexit decision by pushing people and by pushing messages to people um, that were, they knew about. They went, you always have, and you, yes, you have people going from door to door, um, trying to animate you to vote. They only went to the doors where the system told them they are going to vote for Republicans. So they only sounded on those doors. It was about the Trump votes. So Cambridge Analytica said it had a large influence in the vote. And it's also about some, like where it get really hard is there was in Southeast Asia, there were really like massive um, problems. And Cambridge said, it was us who were doing that. We were like steering people to get, um, to, get to the street and stuff and to um, go against the president. And they were really like advertising that they could influence people and that they could make people go to, street, to the street and by transmitting messages to those people. So this is um, where it gets like ethically difficult because I'm not only analyzing people anymore, I'm not only trying to give them recommendations, I'm now influencing, influencing them actively and I try to make them do things. So this is the debate, like are they really, are they really able to do that? So what would evil data scientist Gilly think about them? She would be very much in love with them. What did they do right? Like, um, it is a story, it's a lovely story um, of business. Like they were telling everybody we're able to do that. So it's really cool because that makes everybody believe that data science is magic, which is great for us because it makes everybody believe that we're really changing things. So you have to be conscious that this is also storytelling. It's not. It's not even official that they were supporting Trump. It's just that Trump voted and there was this debate and they were saying, hey, that was us. And I mean, the data science perspective of it is really cool. Like you have all those models from very intelligent guys from, from Cambridge and stuff that were developing those psychometric models and stuff. And then they have those large data sets. So for evil data scientist Gilly, this is lovely. What would she think about it? What would the statistician think about it? Actually, it's quite boring what they um, pretend to do. It's not, statistically, it's not big news. That it's only correlations. It's all about correlations. They have a lot of features about people and it's only correlations. So she would be very bored. And what would she think about it? She would be like, really, what the fuck? Like, this is really dangerous what they're doing. Because the more, it's not stopping because it's ever more data that we're transmitting on the internet. So the possibility to influence our behavior is growing. Okay, so after this practical um, introduction, what am I doing as a statistician? So um, what all those algorithms profit from is correlations and it's dependency. Like what, are, what is dependency? Um, so to Events are statistically or stochastically independent if the occurrence of the one does not affect the probability of occurrence of the other. So when there is dependency, there's correlation, and we're using that correlation. And from a um, statistical perspective, there is two questions that you can ask normally. You can do inference and you can do prediction. What are they doing? They are doing prediction. They want to predict from correlations, what is the person going to click on? So that's prediction. It's quite easy. You just take the correlations and you use them in some kind. An econometrician or a statistician would also ask about inference. Inference is when you really want to know about an effect, when you really want to know what is happening. Does one thing affect the other? That's what you cannot do with correlations. It's causality. It's about causality. So I'm asking about causality. What is happening after what? Like, is he clicking on it because the car is red? You cannot do that with filtering algorithms anymore. And 
So how would I go about um, dependency? Like if I want to predict if somebody will be friends with another one, what am I doing? I'm looking for dependency. Like I, I'm asking myself, who does he know? Like I know Franz and I know the guys from the one data and uh, I know some guys from university. And this person knows a lot of people and the fact that they know each other, it causes dependency because the probability that she likes him is not independent of the probability that he likes her because people have a tendency to reciprocity. They like each other. It's seldom the case that it's independent of whether I know him is independent of if he knows me. So we're using those things. Um, if you like similar people, if I like people that are like me, maybe that talk a lot or whatever, <laughs> then it's homophily. I like people that talk a lot and we can talk blah, blah, it, whole day long. Maybe I prefer people that listen to me sometimes. Um, so it's a dependency effect. So similarity is dependency. It causes statistical de dependency. What else causes um, statistical dependency? If there's a very popular person in a network, then there's dependency because people have a tendency to add that person who already has a lot of friends. That's dependency. It's all information that you can use. There's something else, clustering, like classes or um, if there's groups, this might be a group. That's also dependency. The fact that we're in a cluster is dependency. Okay, so I warned you, I'm going to touch you, but I chose a definition from, uh, like I chose a definition that I'm sure that everybody will understand. So the problem of the um, uh, statistician is endogeneity. Endogeneity is when the expectation about randomness is not zero. So please look at my definition. What is, what is, um, uh, endogeneity, it's the end gegner. That's my definition, okay? So it's the enemy of the statistician is endogeneity and dependence because then you can't tell anymore um, whether it's the color that is influencing the person or if it's some other dependency effect. So dependence is the enemy of inference. I cannot tell anymore whether things are correlated causally or if they are just um, coincidentally, um, if there's correlations. Most about machine learning is only about correlations, it's never about causality. So the guys that are the nerds among the statisticians are more um, about inference. Um, yeah. Um, so the crazy thing about this is I did my PhD in, um, also in spatial analysis. And um, the crazy thing is about is that really very modern uh, filtering algorithms, they take into consideration a lot of different dimensions of space. There's mental space. When we think similarly, we're close in mental space. There's physical space. We have like a distance of three meters from one another. There is a network space. Like I'm close to somebody who has a lot of common connections via friends with me. So there's um, there's also a uh, temporal space, which is also called time. <laughs> so if we're at the same place at the same time, we're, we're probably somehow involved with one another. And what I want to find out is I'm doing research about models that have this multidimensional perspective. And there's algorithms that simultaneously filter all those kinds of spaces but not like separately from one another, but they all mix them together, which creates a whole whatever um, that nobody understands anymore. And that's also what my um, research is about in a more abstract way. Um, more practically, my colleague, he's, she's here, Barbara, she's doing some research with me on networks of software developers. So we're, um, we're trying to see um, we have developers who can collaborate on source code. Maybe the, so just like everybody who's ever used the Git system. We have Manu here who's talking about Git systems in the League of Geeks already. Um, they know that two guys that, or two girls that edit the same chunk of code will be have, they have some kind of connection. And we're asking whether the communication 
and the technical collaboration, whether those influence one another. And that has to do with dependency. Like, if I say um, the technical system will determine how people work together, that's one hypothesis. It's we depend on technical systems. And the other way around, I could say, I need to adapt the technical system, the communication, the Slack channels, or whatever, to the social stuff, and now it gets blah, blah. I um, see you all shutting down your brains, but <laughs> um, so it's about the, in, it's about, so our research is also about the combination of that social space with the technical space that is determined by the software they are using. Okay, so the blah, blah is over. Okay, so what now? The debate about filter bubbles. Um, I mean, filtering, whatever. It's always been the case that we've been filtering and we've always been living in different narratives. Like we've always been receiving different information. Like when there was no internet, we were talking to our neighbors and we were sharing the opinion of our neighbor. So what is the difference whether I have in, friends on the internet or friends that live close to me or both. So, so what can I do about it? Like, is it really a problem? And what can I do about it? Like, uh, should we really counteract the filter bubble effect? I mean, it's really cozy to live in a filter bubble. I don't have to listen to things that I don't like anymore. I don't have to talk to people anymore that are of different opinion. It's, like some people really like the idea of filter bubbles. It's really nice, it's cozy. Like you only have people that think the, think the same things as you do. So what can you do if you don't like it? I mean, the only thing, like what maybe some liberal thinkers did, which I think are the majority here probably, um, was the first thing when they heard about their friends voting AFD was to kick them out from their Facebook. And, um, but actually that, that makes the filter effect even harder and that's not the right thing to do. And um, yeah, and social legal consequences, you can't forbid people to do it. Let's do a practical test. I'm not a very heavy Facebook user, like that's my advantage now because I did, um, I used the same algorithm that um, Cambridge were using for their psychometrics. It's a guy from Cambridge um, University so you can go to the internet site, applymagicsauce.com. The algorithm is called Apply Magic Sauce. And then you log into your Facebook account and your Twitter account and they will have a, they will show your psychological profile. It's really interesting that you can do it. I can show you my results because they were not very good at predicting my um, um, personality. They were telling me that I'm a very contemplative person and I'm not very outgoing. I'm very uh, introverted. Like, uh, yeah. And I'm a very competitive person, apparently. The second one is right. Yeah. <laughs> the one, one out of five. And your decision is right. Yeah, and that one maybe also. I have a tendency to be uh, emotional. I start <laughs> crying sometimes. So, But they were also telling me that I'm probably 20, 21 years old, which was like, <laughs> the best news about it. Like I have, the, I have the online behavior of a 20 year old, it's good. So it's really nice, you can try it out. And um, three open questions that I would like to ask you in the end that we can um, talk about is, first question is, are filter bubbles like obesity? Like people like eating, that's why they, are, um, they, that's why they gain weight. So we also like living in a cozy world. So is it just some illness that we can prevent by being active? Or is it really like somebody evil is trying to put us into a filter bubble and who's trying to manipulate us? So obesity is not something that comes from the outside, but there's different opinions on it. Some people say it's society who uh, makes people eat too much and people can decide not to be um, not to eat so much. So is our filter bubbles like obesity? Second question. Do you remember the sentence, they don't have the capacity to process that data anyway? Like I remember everybody saying like, what the fuck, you can leave your emails on Gmail, they don't have the capacity to proceed it anyway. Like everybody was saying that. But now we have 
the technology to proceed the data. So what, what are the consequences? It's a really big problem that we, like, what is technological process? Like, we can't discuss now when we don't know what is possible with the data in 10 years. And the third question is, um, who profits from the prohibition to sell data? Like, uh, Zuckerberg was very much into legislation on prohibiting that they give data away to other companies. But who's actually profit? Is that really protecting us? If you really keep the data to one company, is that better than giving it out to everyone? Because if, it, if you give the data to everyone, maybe just there is some competition for your opinion. But if it stays in Facebook, it's only Facebook who has access to your personality. So might be better. And something very funny, because um, people are nowadays really like, my God, everybody's watching me. Really funny uh, detail for you. Because I was uh, going to see some friends of mine and I brought them some my Muse. And they was like, I'm not, I'm not buying my Muse anymore. I was like, what? Yeah, they, they are grabbing all those data about me and they are trying to control me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? What happened? And she was like, yeah, they are trying to get my DNA. <laughs> So she was really like, no, I don't eat that immediately anymore. I was like, yeah. oh, when did you receive that email? It was on the 1st of April, obviously. Um, so you, lost, you nearly lost the customer because of that. OK. Thanks for inviting us to the League of Geeks. <laughs>
that's always a chance yeah, to re to find the message. Yeah, it. that's a, another problem. Of course, they can make it somehow anonymous, but the question is how long will it be anonymous until someone finds out. But it's true with the data. I think so. Yeah, I would, I would argue the same. I don't think either Google yeah. nor Facebook are selling data. They would never want to. Yeah. Do no, they were planning to in the beginning. I think what they do is just they give some kind of 50% um, of what people think that or 30% um, of blood to something like that. But I think they do these numbers. I don't think that they sell this personal data. I never heard that. Don't think so. So it, it was actually a plan in the beginning of Facebook that they would also sell some data to, to companies that want to analyze their customers and stuff and who are clicking on their pictures. They stopped it. Why did they stop it? Because they want to keep the data. It's a lot of power. They are not selling it anymore. So, Sorry, yeah. but when they do not use the data, for what should they keep it? So they use it for selling some results. Yeah, they sell the results. They sell the results, but they don't sell the data. So maybe, what, what about forcing them to give the data away, like to everyone? So then, then they cannot, like then there's not only one person who can use it and sell it, and they cannot try to influence you anymore because everybody has the information. So they wouldn't want to sell it because they, it's their power. They, that was an idea that was early established, like they are going to sell your data. They are not selling any data because they want to keep the data to themselves. They only sell the results. What about third-party apps that use Facebook as a platform and uh, those users who click on the app and uh, go for a quiz or something, then uh, they can, like Cambridge Analytica can use that app and get the data from the users. Mm -hmm. The media yeah. will be Facebook. Mm -hmm. That will be the case. Yeah. The, yeah, Peter? Yeah, I think uh, the point would be not if they sell the data or not, but how can they control uh, third parties to get the data, exactly like it happened with uh, Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it wasn't Facebook directly who, who gathered this information, but this uh, weird app, but through Facebook. Yeah. And maybe the question would be, um, yeah, to either to, to control it or to have uh, like better measures to control the flow of information. I mean, most of the data that this Cambridge Analytica scandal was about was public data. So they were only crawling it through the use of this quiz. It was not things that people had not published on their site. So it was things that people had published. It was publicly available. It was not like they were using data that was not available. It was not illegal data or whatever. It was crawled public data. And I guess that every, every company who's analyzing data would do that get data, crawl data that they are allowed, like or maybe in some gray zone that they are allowed to get, and they analyze it. So it's not about illegal data. It's, it's about public data, actually. Everybody was giving that information away that Cambridge had. So they just what people weren't conscious about was also that they gave information about their friends away. That was They weren't conscious, but it was public data. I remember one privacy agreement, um, I think it was Facebook, right, but I don't want to swear, where it was written, um, I agree to the usage of my data um, for the current purposes um, of analyzation and for all future purposes. There was this end for all 
future purposes, which is like so abstract, nobody can understand what that means. Like nobody is now, like five years ago, nobody thought it would be so quickly um, feasible to analyze those large amounts of data. So this, this was what I, what I also wanted to say with the sentence, like do you remember that they, we were all saying they are not able to proceed in any way? Because it's not clear what is possible with those data that are still lying around um, in five years. And nobody reads the terms and conditions that we accept. We were only waiting for blog articles where it said, oh my god, did you read that for future purpose and stuff? I didn't read the terms neither. It's not like I'm protecting myself very well. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, I'm actually not sure. I mean, we are much more aware of data privacy issues nowadays. Um, it's, um, it's also that it's going to be a lot more expensive when you violate, uh, violate those things. I mean, we had, there, there are people out there who are not conscious they are, of what they are allowed to do. And up to now, it was left to the companies to really control the, these things. There was no controls. But from May on, like the final phase of the legislation will enter and um, like will be active, and then it will be really, really expensive if we violate laws. And I'm very convinced that there will be regular controls also. And I think it's a large debate. We had some, we had some debates about it, and we had some, some classes about it, like someone coming and telling us, what should you do if a customer sends you data that you're not supposed to have? What can you do then? How should you react? And how, what will be the consequences if you use those data? Yeah? Um, I don't know if uh, anybody watched the, um, <laughs> the hearing. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> um, the hearing of Mark Zuckerberg. Um, so there was kind of an irony because uh, said um, we will solve many problems with machine learning. Um, so he said we will we will figure out how to uh, get rid of hate speech, for example, and doing this automatically with machine learning. And he argued, I think, in like 50% of the questions he answered with uh, the solution is machine learning. But the interesting fact is we are here because of machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. We have this dilemma because of machine learning. So I think there's kind of an irony in this. And um, maybe we will soon have uh, the next GD, uh, what is it called? Hmm? What? GDPR. GDPR, so the next uh, European Union privacy uh, regulation because of this. Because uh, then we have to make it even more secure. We have to completely forbid that companies exchange data in any way. But it will also make many things more complicated. So how are companies working together, right? So uh, I think it's, it's a pretty interesting topic that will probably, um, yeah, uh, we will hear a lot of in the next few times. Well, did you hear the, the quote? I don't know where I found it, but someone after the hearing said, while you have this data set, every program looks like a machine learning program. <laughs> <laughs> services and so on, but alternatives, but my father, for example, tasks 
he always complains about the bad companies, but uh, he has an account everywhere. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think I often wonder, are those data sets not biased towards the uh, less technology savvy, to the less, less experienced, to the less ex uh, concerned ones, towards um, this more arrogant, towards the more uh, stupid ones? <laughs> uh, that's a uh, thing I yeah, often wonder. The other thing, uh, the more scientific thing I would like to um, yeah, say is uh, I would like to give a broader well, yeah, perspective on this yeah. topic. I'm also a researcher at the University of Passau uh, and I'm also doing research into less filter bubbles but more echo chambers, more the huh? social interactive part. Uh, and I'm doing it from another perspective, from psychology. Uh, but I also have some background in big data, so there are two Wellen schlagen in my post. Uh, so, um, what I, the idea, the question I would like to raise is um, a lot of things that are, lots of assumptions that are made in all this discussion about filter charms, uh, filter bubbles and echo chambers, a lot of these assumptions uh, are simply assumptions uh, concerning the effects, for example. In the beginning you said, uh, what you can read everywhere, that uh, filter bubbles and echo chambers uh, make people think that everyone is on their side, that if I uh, support Hillary Clinton and Facebook shows me stuff, uh, uh, while I see all my contacts are also supporting Hillary Clinton, does uh, this make me also think I'm in the majority and I'm doing the right thing and all, uh, all is good. Um, well, but this is an assumption. Uh, if we are talking about echo chambers and uh, filter bubbles and uh, if they are bad and evil and if we have to do something about them, we first have to test these assumptions in a causal way, in an experimental way. And uh, this is what I'm trying to do. And mm -hmm. I find it quite interesting that a lot of the literature which tries to do this is coming from big data. Uh, for example, analyzing a large uh, Twitter data set and looking if determining, de de determining uh, the political view of a user and look uh, checking which users interact with this user and then they find uh, a bias, for example. But uh, this is still correlated. Uh, I think what we have to do, which I'm trying to do in an experimental way, mm -hmm. uh, with a small setting and few people, uh, is uh, really checking if I take a person and put it in an echo chamber, so showing him or uh, her information that is biased, showing him information that has social cues like likes and so on, and then checking all these assumptions. Uh, does uh, his uh, yeah, convictions, his attitudes change, intensify, for example, if he gets support, um, does his estimation of social support for his own ideas, what we call uh, false consensus uh, in research, uh, does the social change with uh, echo chambers and so on. So what I just want to say is um, there are, I think, filter bubbles are real, I think they have, they may have effects, but at the moment, from a scientific, psychological view, we cannot really say that uh, there is an empirical, causal evidence for that effect. We, just, we first have to get this evidence. And perhaps we can all then rejoice because, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, if I see that uh, posts have a lot of likes, uh, which I see on my Facebook page, and I click on them, and uh, yeah, perhaps it does not have an effect on me. Perhaps mm -hmm. it has, I see they have a lot of likes, but it does not change my attitude. So what I just want to say is... Yeah. Um, what it's not proved. It's not uh, like there's no evidence about it. And I think it's very important to do research on it. And as you say, like there's uh, big data is always correlations. And there's maybe a bias in the, in the sample and there's maybe a bias in your sample, so we need a lot of different opinions on it. But maybe taking counteractive measures now by education ca would help anyway, like by teaching people that this is an effect that exists. So everybody should be aware of that, that may, might happen. 
So I, I agree that it's very important to have causal evidence also. I mean, it's a, it's a question what, what consequences you fear. It's, it's a question if you just fear somebody using your data and knowing maybe what illnesses you have and stuff, then you can hide in a hole. Um, I'm also like that. I, I'm very aware of what might happen, but I still click on everywhere and I'm always out of time and I'm never like optimizing my, and my geolocation is always on. Like. Mm -hmm. But, and other people have technology that make them. So I'm also like that, but I'm, I'm, I think that I'm, there's an interesting aspect about it. Like this being prone to, um, um, to seeing your own opinion being validated by your surroundings is more present in well-educated people. Like a lot of professors, when you, when you make economic professors do predictions about the future of the economy, they are worse, like they are a lot worse and like really, really a lot worse than just anyone from the street because they are so much into their ideas and they are very well educated, they are professors and whatever. They are much more prone to being biased in their judgment. So it's not a question of education. So there are some really educated guys like, and what's, what's it, the, yeah, what is, what is the consequence of knowing that you're being influenced? It's, it's a question. Like, I'm still being influenced by what I read and what information I receive. But by being aware of it, maybe I can counteract it also. I, think, I do think that it's very important that people know that they are, they are receiving biased information. Dara? Yeah, <laughs> it's an old phenomenon. It's it's always been like that. Maybe like um, I receive from the father of my boyfriend. He used to be a doctor, and he didn't have time to read the newspapers. And now he's retired, and he started reading the newspaper, and he re started receiving all those weird articles from friends of his. And he's like, on a regular basis, like every three days, we receive some article that somebody had scanned from some newspaper, some scan, and he's sending it to us. And then it's written like some, some refugee receives 8,000 euros per month, per week or whatever. And then he asks us, is that true? Like he's really interested in making the distinction, what, what is true and what is not true. While I, when I read things, it's, more, it's less about is that true or is it not true. So maybe that's a generation thing that I'm not thinking so much in terms of is it true or is it not true. It's always like some kind of opinion. I'm not worried so much about is it true or is it not true. It's, I'm reading it and I'm taking the information. I, I think I have a different perspective on being true and not true than him. He always wants to know is that true and he wants always true or false. And um, so he's really worried about the information he's receiving, but he's always interested in wrong or right. And then when I say it's an opinion, he's like, yeah, but is it a true opinion? <laughs> <laughs> so it's really interesting. I think it's a question of generations also. Okay. Any more comments or? Okay, cool. Then I thank you. Very much. Thank you.